The reading can be found on page 1188, page 1188, um, and it's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, commencing at verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and to acknowledge you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encouraging, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. We're going to look at the passage that Brenda read this morning. If you would like to follow it in your Bibles, and that might be helpful, it's on page 1188, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Can I ask how many of you have travelled by train, say, in the last three years? Put your hands up. Yeah, quite a number of you. If you have, you will have been constantly bombarded by announcements on the tannoy, tannoy or on signboards, see it, say it, sort it. <laughs> and the message, of course, is designed to encourage people to report incidents or trouble quickly so that it can be dealt with. Um, but uh, there are cynics around who would say that nothing ever really gets sorted quickly. And I was reminded of this um, by our text in the message version of the passage that we read, the last verse. The one who called you, the one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. If he said it, he'll do it. And that, that is my text this morning. That is the key thought that I want to bring us at the end of the year. In the NIV we read, the one who calls you is dependable is faithful and he will do it. So if you take nothing else away from uh, this morning, however old you are um, or young you are, remember this. If God said it, he'll do it. Can I ask you all uh, a direct and personal question? How has 2023 been for you spiritually? Has your relationship with God grown or developed during the year? Or have things been a struggle? Does God perhaps feel distant or withdrawn? The end of the year uh, is a traditional time to have a stock take of our lives, what we've learned from the last year, and what are our plans, our dreams, the opportunities that lie before us for 2024. Maybe you've not really got started yet. You may be yearned for a relationship with God in Christ, but nothing seems to have happened yet. Perhaps if you're uh, honest, you're a bit concerned about the demands that Jesus Christ might make on your life. We've all had our ups and downs during the year, difficult times, disappointments, as well as achievements and memorable moments. The hard times, as I'm sure many will testify, can often be learning experiences as we see how dependable God is to be with us in trouble if we trust him, or they can drive us away from him. Success and prosperity can lead us to neglect our relationship with God too. 
So do you feel closer to God than you did at the beginning of 2023? Or have you walked away? We can say with confidence from this passage and other scriptures that while you may feel you're losing your grip on God, he certainly hasn't lost his grip on you. If he said it, he'll do it. These are two sides indeed of the same coin. If on our side we commit ourselves fully to trust God and put our life and our future in his hands, then we will find that he is faithful to his promises and he will never let us go. I was reminded of what the writer to the Hebrews says, again in the message translation, the Lord is my helper, who or what can get to me? Paul is saying in this passage to the young church in Thessalonica, which is still an important city and seaport in the north of Greece, in this final chapter 5 of his first letter, he says you have been made whole again by Christ's death for you. You are a child of God. If you've trusted Christ as your saviour, he will never let you go. They were concerned, uh, as we see earlier in chapter 5, about Christians who have died as to what would happen to them. Remember that life expectancy was very short on average in those days. But Paul says, whether awake, we're awake with the living or asleep with the dead, we're alive with Christ. Doesn't that give us hope and assurance? And what a marvellous promise, especially for those who are grieving at this time. So this is what God has promised. What is our part? And this is particularly what Paul sets out in the verses that we read this morning. They read like a, a sort of memorable checklist that he was giving to the young Christians in the church in Thessalonica and has become part of the scriptures that we have. If you forget nothing else, don't forget these particular points as you ponder your Christian life. So I want to focus on this checklist as points for us all to take on board as we move forward into 2024, especially in our life together as believers in the church. However old we are, there are points here for all of us. I'm going to take these slightly out of the order that they come in the passage though. First of all, in verses 16 to 18, be cheerful and be thankful. Be cheerful and be thankful. And this is an encouragement that we see often in the scriptures and is universally applicable to all believers. The message says, be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants those of you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. Fundamental to living like this is to have full confidence that God is in control and he will be our helper whatever happens. <coughs> Otherwise, most of us would find this impossible to live by, I think, even if we're naturally cheerful people. That's not easy, and I, I certainly admit to finding it difficult to take on board. If life is hard for us for whatever reason, if we're in constant pain or uncertainty about us, uh, and for those who are younger, we have concern about money, about relationships, and decisions about the future, God knows and God cares. There are role models in our fellowship, uh, and that's such an encouragement to me, of those who are cheerful and positive even when things are difficult. If this isn't a pattern of life that you've yet adopted, pray that God will help you adopt that habit of being cheerful and thankful in the new year. Try and get into the habit, as the writer says, pray all the time, of a constant conversation with God during your day, whatever happens. It will help you deal with, with issues as they take place in your life. Things get lost, you get delayed, you get frustrated by this and that. And it'll help when temptation comes along too. We can bring everything to God, our friends, our family, our church, everything that is a matter of concern and interest to our lives. Nothing is too important uh, for God to, to take an interest in or to deal with. So seek God, thank God, whenever, even when you're crying out in frustration and disappointment, as we all do sometimes. 
The NIV says, give thanks in all circumstances, not give thanks for all circumstances. We don't give thanks necessarily for things that happen uh, in our lives, but we can give thanks to God who is with us. Let's learn actively to praise God for our blessings, even when we feel things are going against us. This isn't about being, quotes, relentlessly positive, as, as some people um, encourage us to do, but trusting that God is with us and God will help us whatever life throws at us. So, firstly be cheerful and thankful, secondly love one another. And this is how again the message translation puts it. Get along among yourselves, each of you doing your part. Be patient with each person, attentive to individual needs. And very honestly here, be careful that when you get on each other's nerves you don't snap at each other. Look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. Aren't, aren't those good words? This is a paraphrase, but how practical Paul was. Um, right at the beginning of this passage he says, encourage one another and build one another up. We know that the Apostle Paul was only too well aware, uh, because we see references to it in his individual letters to the churches, that it was also far too easy for Christians to fall out and to show dislike of other people. So all this takes great effort and prayer. There are undoubtedly people who may at times irritate us and rub us up the wrong way, but it's part of being Christ-like to show patience and grace. We will get on each other's nerves at times, as we do in our earthly families, but it takes grace not to show it. And again, not something we can do in our own strength. As this uh, message uh, passage says, look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. Praise God for the person concerned and their strengths and their good qualities. Don't write people off as difficult or unreliable. Let's be careful too in our conversations and not criticise or take issue with others behind their backs. Again, easy to slip into. One of my favourite little psalms is Psalm 133, and I'm sure many of you will know it. How good, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity, for there the Lord has commanded his blessing. A church loses spiritual power where there is a lack of love and a critical spirit. Paul says as well, look out for the strugglers, those with particular issues or problems or health issues, those on their own, those struggling in other areas of their lives. This is something we all need to do, whatever generation we're in. I hope your Christmas get-togethers have been good. Um, sometimes we have an element of trepidation, don't we, when we have uh, big Christmas get-togethers. At this Christmas season, let us be appreciative of family members, even of those we find it difficult to get along with, or who indeed may even have hurt us in the past. The scriptures say as well, honour your parents and show them love and appreciation. And, and that applies whatever age we are. That's one of God's key commandments. Pray for people by name. If we're committed to sharing Jesus, talking Jesus, as we've done in our recent course, in our family circles, our grace and forbearance should be um, evident in our behaviour to all. If others are holding a grudge, then demonstrate that you can show grace and forgiveness. That's what uh, walking in love means. The third uh, practical point after loving one another that uh, Paul raises here is honour your leaders. Paul says, show love and practical appreciation to all who have taken on responsibilities to leadership. And there are lots of leaders in this church and different organisations and different spheres of our work. And it can often be costly in terms of time and preparation and spiritual responsibility particularly where people combine roles with other things outside the church. So show your appreciation, give your support and love uh, to all who are called to lead. 
And then fourthly, and this is my last main key point, um, don't suppress or don't quench the Holy Spirit. And I feel it's significant that this is included in Paul's little checklist. You will recall that we mentioned earlier last year, uh, as we considered our church profile in, in, in support of our search for a new minister, some of the things that we need to think about and, and highlight. We've said that we need to be constantly alert and open to what God is saying to us as a congregation, especially about changes we may need to make or initiatives we may need to take. I believe that to quench the spirit is to insist on our own ways or ideas and sometimes to rule out ideas or thoughts because they are too new or too radical to us. If we're asking God to show us the way and the road ahead, we need to be aware that this may come to us, that God's word may come to us from unexpected people and in unexpected ways. Let's just be open to listen to the voice of God wherever it might be heard. And the danger is that if we constantly quench the Spirit, we may find it increasingly difficult to hear God's voice at all. And, and that may become more difficult for us and he may become more distant to us. But of course the command to us is to test and to weigh everything and to seek God's will and direction in praying these things through together. Churches that are able to do this are the ones who are moving forward and seeing God at work in new and exciting ways. So, in conclusion, Paul ends his letter by saying that this is part of God's purpose in making us whole and complete human beings made in his image and holy, holy as we take on board the likeness of his son Jesus in our lives and behaviour. God wants us to bear fruit in our lives during this year to come and increasingly commend Jesus to others uh, and, to, and to be more definitive about that. These are practical steps here in this passage to enable us to do this effectively. Can I ask in conclusion that we are open to God and we are able to do a bit of self-assessment? How are we doing in the light of what God's Word says? Be honest with ourselves and before God. Can I encourage you to take time over this New Year period to do that and to pray these things through? And I know there will be different issues for each one of us. The encouragement that we can draw from this passage is summed up in our key verse. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he will do it. We're not on our own and we can't be the men and women God wants us to be in our own strength. But God, as always, is able to do far more than we can ever ask or think. So as we conclude, just, let's just spend a minute quietly in prayer as we bring these things to God. Father, we thank you indeed for that promise that if you've said it, you will do it. And Lord, we ask for grace to trust you more, to love you more, to seek you more. Father, just be with us as we, as we pray and as we seek your, your presence and help, Lord, in the year to come. Father, thank you for all that is past. And Lord, we bring the future and, and put it into your hands. Because we do it in the strength and the grace and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.